Most of us are used to having information right at our fingertips, with questions and answers just a Google away. But more often than not, it's hard to know the truth of what's going on in the world, and the constant onslaught of information from news outlets can sometimes make us feel powerless, mistrusting, or even apathetic. And when it comes to the climate crisis, we now know that fossil fuel companies funded decades-long campaigns to intentionally misinform folks on this global issue. And even now, mainstream media may refrain from climate reporting if it's just not entertaining enough for the rapid news cycle. Climate misinformation or distraction are forms of news media behaviors that are dangerous as they stagnate the rapid action we need now for a livable planet. So whose responsibility is it to weed out the fake news? And what is the role of large social media companies and news outlets in mediating information? And how can you learn to recognize and avoid misinformation? In today's episode, we'll explore climate education and misinformation, so you can be equipped to critically approach media consumption and difficult conversations in your everyday life. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of the BMSE Climate Action Series. That's right, episode 12. You know what they say, it's cheaper by the dozen. But good news for you is that they're all free and on our YouTube channel. So if you missed any of our previous ones, check out the BMSE YouTube channel to check those out. Can't believe it, but we only have two more episodes to go in this series, including today's episode. So I don't want to waste too much of our time. We're going to jump right into exploring climate education and misinformation. Our first guest today is Sean Holman, a professor of environmental and climate journalism at the University of Victoria. Sean is the principal investigator for the Climate Disaster Project, which is a national initiative involving 10 journalism schools across Canada, and that helps those who have lived through climate disasters share their stories with the public. He's also the co-principal investigator for the Climate Coverage in Canada study, the first survey to compare how journalists, climate scientists, and members of the public perceive climate change. Before entering academia, Sean was actually an investigative investigative journalist and documentary filmmaker. As a journalist, he was best known as the founder and publisher of the pioneering British Columbia online public affairs news service, Public Eye, as well as the host and producer of the syndicated talk show, Public Eye Radio. His bylines have appeared in the Columbia Journalism Review, the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, the Vancouver Sun, and the Times Colonist. His research focuses on how we use and misuse information, particularly against the backdrop of catastrophic climate change and biodiversity loss, as well as democratic decline. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sean. Please go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you so very much. Um, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm just going to start up my presentation right now, so hold tight. Excellent. Um, so I'd just like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and Wasanich peoples. And that acknowledgement within the context of what we're talking about today is particularly important because Indigenous peoples both here and elsewhere are among the first and worst affected by climate change as a result of their close relationship with the environment. Um, As mentioned, my name is Sean Holman, and I'm a journalism professor at the University of Victoria. I'm also an investigative journalist as well as a transparency historian, which is a roundabout way of saying I study how we have historically used and misused information and democracies, which is what I'm going to principally talk about today within the context of climate change. But before all of that, uh, I was actually a child of the 1970s. 
Um, and I was growing up in an age that wasn't very dissimilar from the one that we're now living in because this was an age of radiation and resource depletion, pesticides and overpopulation, where we realized for the very first time that we actually had the power of self-annihilation. Yet there was still hope that we wouldn't exercise this power. And that was something that was actually illustrated by futurists in bright blues, yellows, and greens, the kind that you're seeing on the screen right now. And one of those illustrations from the book Future Cities always struck with me. It showed two different trips to the 21st century. The first one on the top was to an earth of hydrogen fuel jets and electric monorails, because really what is the future without a monorail? And the second trip was to an earth where we hadn't achieved that kind of ecological balance, the earth that you see at the bottom of your screen right now, turning green communities into polluted pest holes. And the book illustrated that warning that way. So almost 40 years after that illustration was published, I looked outside my apartment window in downtown Calgary, and I saw the world that I had been warned about as a child, as smoke from wildfires in British Columbia billowed across the Rockies, forcing pedestrians to put on pollution masks. Climate change had arrived in Canada, just as it had already arrived for many other places around the world, even if too many mainstream news outlets were unwilling or unable to say that. And since then, the impacts of climate change have become ever more part of our day-to-day -day lives, with the world's seasons becoming increasingly defined by the disasters that they bring. We know, according to journalists and environmentalists, what's causing these changes human-caused greenhouse gas emissions. And we think we know who is to blame for those emissions. The businesses that produce the products and use the processes that create greenhouse gases and the governments that haven't stopped them. But what we don't talk about as much is how these actions are also a summation of our individual and collective decisions. When we buy meat, or dairy products, we support the livestock industry. When we buy plane tickets, we support the aviation industry. When we buy gasoline, we support the fossil fuel industry. And in supporting these industries, we too contribute to climate change, just as we do when we have children. And indeed, researchers have identified having children, driving cars, taking planes, and eating meat as the individual actions that most contribute to climate change. Of course, businesses have created or enabled these decisions and addictions, just as governments have done little to help us break them from funding fossil fuel extraction to not funding mass transit systems. But we elected these governments on promises that often had more to do with our present comforts and conveniences than future calamities. And we perpetuate the societal norms that are now driving us towards disaster. In doing so, we have consistently violated the assumption that we will use information, truthful information, to make better decisions about the world around us so we can exert control over public and private institutions and feel more certain about that world. This is the flawed assumption that underpins our democracy. In other words, climate change isn't just an environmental problem. It's a political and societal one. But where did this assumption come from? In many ways, it came amidst the ruins of the First and Second World Wars. At the time, the greatest thinkers were asking why millions had died by human hands, not once, but twice within the span of 31 years. And for some, the answer to that question 
was propaganda, censorship, and secrecy. If only the German people had known what the Nazis were actually like, the world never would have descended into war. And he felt that information might have averted those wars and their atrocities. And that belief in its power profoundly influenced post-war politics, a period of extreme uncertainty where the world seemed to be spinning out of control. Now that period appropriately began with the detonation of two atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But the power of the atom wasn't the only reason why the public felt the world had become more uncertain, more uncontrollable, and more threatening. Because this was also the era of big businesses and even bigger governments. And with that expansion came the potential for abuse. Sometimes that took the form of poisons such as asbestos, thalidomide, and DDT. Other times it took the form of political corruption, suppression, and surveillance. But information was seen as the one thing that could restore our control over these forces, restoring certainty to an uncertain world. Because if we only we knew what these big businesses and big governments were actually doing, we could do something about them. And this has informed everything from the modern environmental movement, the modern consumer movement, to investigative journalism. And we have been living in that world ever since, a world that may no longer exist if it ever did in the first place. Every day, this becomes more and more apparent during the pandemic. We know masking prevents the spread of the coronavirus. So do vaccines. These are scientific truths. Yet we see people refusing to wear masks and get vaccines while protesting those who act in accordance with the evidence. It's easy for us to other them as they other us. But the truth is, is that these are our friends, family members, and neighbors. What separates us is our acceptance or rejection of evidence, which has become the most important division in modern politics. And it is also the most important reason why we are confronting at least 30 years of climate change. That means climate change can be best understood as a post-truth apocalypse. An apocalypse created by our failure to make the kind of rational and empathetic decisions expected of us in a democracy. In the post-war period, information was how we tried to exert control and certainty over the world. But as the world becomes even more uncertain and more uncontrollable due to climate change, people will look for other forms of certainty and control. They will look to conspiracy theories, extremist ideologies, extremist theologies, the misinformation and disinformation we see in our society today as the twisted roots of nationalism and nativism overrun us. And this is what could be the undoing of our world as we know it. This is what could be, and this is in many ways what already is. So what do we do about this? I'll be discussing some of those solutions to that problem a little bit later on today with all of uh, the other panelists. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. But if information was our means of exerting control and certainty over the world in the post war period, I believe that community will be our means of exerting control and certainty over the world in this new age of disaster. Because community also creates Control and certainty. And it has been behind every major social movement that has mattered in this age. And I believe that we can together create and empower a more equitable and resilient and fact based community 
around our climate change experiences because the truth of that experience is we are all climate disaster survivors. Whether we've experienced heat waves, flooding, wildfires, smoke, wildfires. And I believe that if we can recognize and mobilize this shared identity, that we will be able to find control and certainty against this backdrop of climate and democratic collapse. And that's where I'll leave it. Thanks, John. What a whirlwind. Whew. That was a lot to cover, and I'm sure we'll dig in more into those topics during the discussion. Um, our next guest today is Rochelle Baker, a reporter with Canada's National Observer, thanks to a grant from the Local Jour Journalism Initiative of the Government of Canada. And Rochelle has worked as a newspaper reporter and photographer in BC for close to a decade. And as a reporter with National Observer, she covers stories important to coastal communities and the Discovery Islands, including resource and land use. First Nations rights and issues, social justice, fisheries, aquaculture, and ocean science, conservation, and biodiversity, often through a climate change lens. So we're so glad that she could join us today. Rochelle, please go ahead and share with us today what was on your mind when it comes to climate education and misinformation. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Um, I guess um, after that really interesting um, overview from Sean, I feel like my perspective um, in this conversation might be while Sean has gives us a really excellent high level overview um, based on his academic experience. I suspect that from my perspective, I'll be uh, while while focusing in on themes of accuracy and who information benefits and um, fairness and social justice and climate change. I'll be providing my perspective at a micro level um, and the focus and approach I take as a journalist. Um, you've mentioned some of my uh, some of the issues that I cover. Um, just a bit about myself. I actually live and report on the uh, live in the communities I report on. Uh, I live on Quadra Island, spend a reasonable amount of time on Cortez. My focus and approach is largely to really focus in on people and communities, the impacts of climate change on those communities and the solutions um, that they are coming up with. And surprisingly, um, uh, despite me being based in the Discovery Islands, which Quadra and Cortez are two small islands off the Northeast of Vancouver Island, um, not far from Campbell River, um, I find that both communities are at the epicenter of a lot of interesting stories um, that I often use to exemplify wider issues of importance, often around climate change at a regional, provincial, and even national level, uh, especially with regards to rural concerns. Um, as you mentioned, I, I tend to try to amplify voices that aren't necessarily represented by large corporate interests or government um, and reflect issues and stories that are important uh, to coastal communities and the Discovery Islands. So, of course, that involves um, focusing on land use, resource extraction, First Nations rights and reconciliation, social justice, housing, toxic drug, the toxic drug crisis. A lot of these issues, of course, um, are issues in urban centers, but of course, um, there seems to be a bit of a black hole of information about how they're also um, causing really wide impacts in rural communities as well, as well as salmon, 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 fisheries, conservation and biodiversity, and of course, the very focus of um, the Banfield Marine Sciences Center's webinar, which is climate change and the ocean, which is really uh, jives with uh, many of the focuses and stories that I do. Um, I think that that's um, about it from me. Uh, 
I guess my observations would be, uh, I agree with Sean that there's been kind of almost this black, uh, this negligence of covering climate change for decades, but it was curious to see um, following the floods and fires and heat waves this summer, how I feel this issue has come alive in a way um, that previously I, I hadn't felt before um, in sort of more mainstream uh, mainstream media. So, and I guess I'd also observe that it's gotten to the stage where at first blush, most stories may not appear to be climate stories, but in fact, most of my stories can't be separated from climate change, whether it's fisheries or forestry. Um, at this stage, uh, I'm finding that virtually everything has a climate angle. Thanks so much, Rochelle. Yeah, it's really interesting hearing from the larger scale what's happening with the breakdown of information and then at a micro scale how you experience that. And I know personally, I really enjoy reading your stories because they have those personal narratives and stories of what's happening with climate solutions. Um, so we'll dig into that a little later and we'll transition now into our final guest, um, who's Abir Siddiqui. And she's a science librarian at McMaster University and adjunct professor in the School of Interdisciplinary Science. So she advocates for effective science communication through storytelling as a way of building trust and creating conversations within our communities about topics in science and in health. As an instructor, Abir has contributed to over a dozen courses with lectures on science literacy, which refers to the necessary skills beyond subject knowledge that students need to succeed as scientists. So this also includes information like science literacy and science communication. So over the past three and a half years, she has strategically embedded science literacy instruction across second, third, and fourth year courses so that students are able to practice and master these skills throughout various programs in the Faculty of Science. And her work in science literacy seeks to embed community-engaged practices, including bringing community into the classroom and exploring science communication within diverse communities, including with young kids, LGBTQ+, and both rural and urban communities. So her goal is to use storytelling to express our understanding of sometimes complex or controversial scientific topics. Thank you so much for joining us, Abir, in this conversation today. Please go ahead. Thank you, Anari. Uh, I can only apologize for sending you such a lengthy and convoluted bio. Uh, I think you could have ended it at Abir as a science librarian. Um, but like you mentioned, I'm based out at McMaster University, which is in Hamilton, Ontario. So a little bit uh, more east than most of the folks in the room probably. I also wanted to acknowledge the traditional territories on which I reside. So the traditional territories here are the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, whose joint stewardship of this land is acknowledged with a dish, uh, dish with one spoon wampum. For those of you who don't know what a wampum is, a wampum is a beaded belt that sort of, sort of metaphorically describes this agreement. The dish represents the land, the spoon represents that we are to share those resources of this land equitably and sustainably. We are supposed to leave enough for future generations. Now, when we think about that dish with one spoon wampum, we can think about it in terms of the principles of equitable access, which I care a lot about as a librarian and sustainability. And I hopefully can speak to some of those principles in the work that I do as a researcher, as well as an instructor. I also wanted to share one of my favorite quotes by one of my favorite writers, Zainab Tepeki, who is a sociologist and I now believe is based out um, doing some work with the New York Times. She wrote, the most effective forms of censorship today involve meddling with trust and attention, not muzzling speech itself. As a result, they don't look much like the old forms of censorship at all. So really thinking about how our forms of censorship now have less to do with actually silencing free, free speech, but more with making folks distrust credible sources of information. And that relationship with trust is something that I like to explore in my current research. So one of the research projects that I think really brought me to this panel um, is the current research project that I'm doing with Hamilton Public Library. 
Um, and Ari mentioned right off the bat that I'm a science librarian. Um, I also think that a science librarian, while I love my job, is the less cool librarian in the larger field. Don't tell my boss, but I do think that public libraries and public librarians and public library workers in general have a much more important role in society. Public libraries, uh, by their definition, are public, meaning that they should be and are accessible to everybody in their respective communities, unlike academic librarians um, who usually deal with people who can afford university education or college education and are um, crossing those barriers. And usually public libraries are investing in their communities in some way, shape, or form, meaning that they have built some level of trust and relationships with their own respective communities. So in this research project, uh, we interviewed a number of public library workers, uh, librarians, frontline staff, everybody across the board about their um, conceptions of mis misinformation and disinformation, as well as what they thought would help in intervening with the spread and this infodemic of misinformation and uh, disinformation. While we just wrapped up our semi-structured interviews just last week, so I don't have uh, concrete outcomes to share, I can share that one of the big things that came out of here was that there was a general mistrust of government agencies, that the folks who were most susceptible in the eyes of public library workers, um, most susceptible to misinformation and disinformation were the, the folks who resided in the margins of society. So Hamilton has a high rate of poverty and a high rate of substance abuse. Those fo same folks are often the people who feel most neglected by government agencies. So when those same agencies are now telling them to mask up, to get vaccinated, that trust, that capital is not there to inform those decisions. And a lot of folks who sort of spoke about this also talked about asking their superiors, their people who are spending money in this area to invest not in information campaigns, not necessarily in one-off um, info sessions, but rather investing in people, investing in frontline workers, investing in librarians, so that they can then in turn can build those relationships with their communities to earn that trust. My intention is to hopefully expand this research in Banfield, in fact. So I'm hoping at some later date, thinking about the ways in which the BMSC, the Banfield Marine Science Center, has really invested in its community and built these long sustainable relationships with its communities. And if there is um, some impact on how the community now believes uh, in science or how it trusts science based on the relationships they have built with uh, visiting scientists and residing scientists alike. So the other thing that I wanted to pivot to was my instructional role. So I do a little bit of research, but primarily my job at Mac is teaching. I teach a lot. And one of the courses that I teach is science and storytelling, which is basically teaching science students um, in fourth year about how they can use creative forms of narrative to communicate science to a wide range of audiences. The primary goal of this uh, project, this course, is actually not necessarily communication skills, but relationship building skills, community building skills. A lot of their assignments are geared towards getting them to listen to each other, listen to their respective communities, build a level of empathy, understand that communicating science is about communicating science as a verb, not as a noun. It's not just about communicating the data, the scientific outcomes, but rather thinking about science as a process that helps us understand and engage with the world around us. So those opportunities are often baked in my instruction and hopefully have informed my research as well. I'm excited to talk about that a little further as well in our larger conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Abir. I am seeing a trend of some common themes popping out through all of these discussions so far already. And Abir, I'll just give you a quick break and start off with a question for Sean and Rochelle. Um, and by the way, audience members, if you have a question, please go ahead and, and put into the Q&A function. We'll, we'll relay that to the guests today. Um, so one thing that I've noticed sometimes when it comes to climate reporting or other sometimes controversial issues is that folks will try and have a balanced perspective and have, for example, feature somebody who denies climate change and a climate scientist on um, their show or interview. 
how could this actually be kind of limiting for journalists or consumers? Um, I think it's interesting. I think we have to think about what the purpose of the news media is in the democracy. And the purpose of the news media and the democracy, if we're sort of thinking about it sort of utilitarian value, right, is really to facilitate the kind of informed, empathetic, and rational decisions that are expected of us in society. So having guests on um, who are not evidence-based, um, when we know uh, that climate change is happening, when we know that humans are causing it, is not consistent with what the purpose of the news media is. Um, and that's not censorship, um, restricting those people. That's just ensuring that we're filling our role as members of the news media, because it doesn't help, right? When you inject misinformation and disinformation into the system, that is the opposite of what we would expect in a democracy. And the news media, I think it's really important to be clear here, are not common carriers. We're not like the telephone system. We're not obliged to carry every single message that comes across the transom. Our obligation is to share truthful information, to share the evidence. So um, I think we're seeing that less, that kind of both sideism, although we are still seeing it uh, on the part of Post Media, which is the largest newspaper chain in the country and looks like it's going to become even larger. Rochelle, did you have a comment on that question? And then I have another question about post media that you bring now that you bring that up Sean uh yeah I do I mean I echo uh some of the things uh that Sean was saying that you know we're not a I think sometimes we think balanced reporting I'm not a big fan of the term balanced reporting uh it suggests that we need to give equal weight to all sides of an issue whereas I prefer um, and I'm seeing somewhat of a shift to fair and accurate reporting. Um, I agree with Sean that we're not obliged to amplify um, points of view that aren't based in fact or accuracy. Um, we're not an equal opportunity provider for people, or corporations or governments. Um, and I also think that, yeah, there's just definitely dangers associated with the old journalistic trope that you must give both sides equal say. I once had somebody come up to me at a municipal uh, council meeting suggesting that I wasn't providing, they'd done a word count in my stories and suggested I wasn't doing balanced reporting because I hadn't given both sides an equal amount of paragraph space. Um, but I agree with Sean. It's up to journalists to verify uh, facts and what people say before sliding it into stories or articles. And um, if they have, if people have legitimate points of views or opinions that they can back up with facts, um, great. But I don't think it's uh, it's journalism's role to be presenting the fact that the world is flat. Um, Another danger around the notion of balanced reporting is it also tends to create false equivalencies. Um, you know, we we see it in climate change. I think you know some of the examples that I that that you know are very obvious around this are for many years. I think one reason climate change was ignored so long was we gave voice for too long to climate deniers, despite knowing that they weren't fact-based. Um, you know, another prime example of balanced reporting, uh, which created false equivalencies were, you know, the iconic Hillary Clinton email scandal um, and Trump's many and more serious, um, I don't even know, issues, I guess, is the word. And I think also, too, um, 
I think we've seen that to a certain extent with the anti-vaccine debate, where by leg legitimately perhaps trying to demonstrate um, the pressures and the pressures that people are under with COVID that perhaps we've amplified a message that doesn't have a basis in fact. Um, so those are just some of the, you know, some of my thoughts when we talk about balanced reporting. Thank you. It's, it's heartening to hear that there's a bit of a shift away from that, at least when it comes to climate. Mm -hmm. Um, Sean, you mentioned post media. Um, and I think everyday folks, you know, we sometimes just go to a couple different news sources if you're thinking about trying to diversify who you're getting news from or news media from. But could you tell us a little bit more about post, post media and how that fits into the structure of decline in democracy? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I want to be clear here. There are a lot of good journalists who do still work at Post Media and are trying their hardest to serve their communities. And we have to remember that Post Media serves a lot of communities. They are the owners of most major newspapers in Canada. But on the op-ed side, on the editorial side, on the column side of the equation, Post Media has been really destructive in terms of sharing uh, information from climate science rejectionists, from casting doubt right, on what we know are the facts of climate change and what we know um, about the catastrophe that we're headed to. Um, it's almost as if in a lot of ways that those journalists uh, in those newsrooms are human shields for the kind of disinformation and misinformation that's being pumped out by that chain uh, regarding climate change. Um, and I think it's disturbing. It's disturbing because this is also a publicly funded chain as well as a result of the tax benefits that they're now receiving. Um, so I really wonder um, whether or not this is consistent with the tax benefits that are being provided to post media, this kind of activity. Um, and I really wonder what to do about it. Um, it doesn't seem that the National News Media Council, which post media belongs to, is really particularly interested in holding post media to account for this behavior. This is the uh, organization that is supposed to be basically an ombudsman for the news media industry. Doesn't seem that the government is willing to do anything either in terms of how it handles those tax credits. So we're essentially left with this engine of misinformation and disinformation on the editorial pages of post media um, that is really harming our, our society and really harming democratic discourse. Because when you see those things on those op-ed pages, when you see those things in major newspapers, it provides credence to them, it provides credibility to them. And that credibility doesn't just exist in Canada, it exists all over the world where other climate science rejectionists can then point to this material and see, say, look, right, you know, our opinions, right, this is still contested, right? Our opinions are, are, are correct when in fact they're not. I noticed that you're using the term climate science rejectionists. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, this is sort of to the room, but um, I've noticed a little bit of a shift when it comes to using the language around climate skeptic, climate denier, climate contrarian, um, and now climate science rejectionist. Are you noting a, noticing a shift in news media and then also a beer within how we talk about um, climate science in the sort of education realm of language and like what is more accurate or acceptable? Um, I actually prefer this term. And the reason I prefer this term is because a lot of climate science deniers um, get jumped up about being called climate science deniers. And they get jumped up about being called climate science deniers because they see an equivalency to that uh, between that and, and Holocaust deniers. Um, now, I can have an argument about whether or not I think that's the case or not. I'm not really interested in that argument. Um, but I don't believe skeptic, right, or contrarian are appropriate terms, right? 
Um, you know, skeptic kind of means that, to my way of thinking, that you're kind of interrogating something, right? You're 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 challenging something, and and in a lot of ways, this is an unchallengeable fact at this particular point in time. So I prefer the term climate science rejectionist because I think that's what we're talking about. They are rejecting evidence. They are they are they are rejecting. Um, what we know about climate change. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think a lot of it centers around control and certainty um, because it is too difficult uh, to accept uh, some of the changes that we will have to deal with as a result of climate change for these communities. Um, so I think climate science rejection is, uh, is a, uh, a nice term, right? That sort of uh, gets at what we're really talking about here without triggering that, um, that response uh, from the climate denial community. Interesting. I might have to start using that more and thinking about that. Abir, do you have um, anything to share on this point? Yeah, um, I must admit that in my class and in my conversations with students, we don't necessarily spend too much time talking about the, the various terms uh, that apply here. But we do talk a little bit about the forms of climate denial. So there are folks who are in the room who may, not in this room, but in general rooms, who may deny climate change uh, in, in their belief that they, it just is not happening. There's no evidence that it's happening. There are people who believe that climate change is happening, but it's not attributed to human action, man-made man uh, changes in the environment. And then there are folks who believe that climate change is real, that it's caused by folks, uh, by humans, but there is no serious impact of that change. And then you have stage two denial, which is that yes, uh, climate change is real, it's caused by humans, its impact is serious, let's spend the next decade or so debating on how we should be addressing that instead of actually looking at the evidence about how that requires immediate action. So we do spend a fair bit of time talking about varying levels of climate denial, and we do talk about how the only way to engage in that conversation is to listen first. You need to know who you're talking to before you sort of uh, engage with effective forms of communication to address it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for breaking down that distinction, too, of the different types of denial. Um, before we move on, Rochelle, I just was wondering if you had anything you wanted to add to that? I really love the various uh, stages of climate denial. And I found that really interesting what Sean mentioned about there being this sort of open or implicit support of climate denial uh, by the what we call that the, the opinion or editorial end of, of post-media coverage. But I think there's also in some ways, um, you know, aside, uh, and again, I qualify my comments like, like Sean did, that there are a lot of people doing good work under difficult conditions. But I think there's a lot of democracy and accurate information around climate change is also compounded by conglomeration of media, which we see in post media and other uh, areas of the world. Um, in BC, there's, you know, community papers are largely dominated by the black press chain, let's say, on in BC. And while it might not be intentional or tacit support of climate denial, conglomeration of media still has massive effects on the way um, our ability to distribute, create, and um, produce fair and accurate information around climate change and other issues. You know, with a uh, conglomeration of media, intertwined with the collapse and contraction, a contraction of traditional media, what you find is you find a real narrowing of voices and perspectives with combined with a huge increase of workloads. So typically where you might have 
a host of reporters in Victoria or Ottawa doing work from a variety of different perspectives and covering politics and climate change. You now have fewer watchdogs. Um, the workload and number of stories that any one reporter must cover has increased. You have one voice perhaps speaking about climate change for an entire one single voice and perspective um, covering climate stories for an entire change chain of newspapers, uh, particularly at a community level and community newsrooms. So what this does is um, censors it by omission, censors information around climate change um, and media and by omission. So you find uh, limited perspectives um, and approaches and lenses to cover an existing issue such as climate change. And of course, uh, investigative work is a dozen, the time it, it needs to become a critical voice, um, let's say around climate change or any other issues is uh, there's little time for the remaining journalists in new newsrooms, particularly smaller ones. They just simply don't have the time to dig. Um, so there's a couple interesting points here. I know, Sean, you originally mentioned that sometimes newsrooms are unable or unwilling to cover climate issues. And Rochelle, you've pointed out some of the limitations they might have in terms of capacity. Um, do you have suggestions? This is a, actually a question from an audience member on institutions to rebuild public trust in the face of austerity and underfunding um, that has potentially led to mistrust from where people get information? I guess I worry that the age of information is over in some ways. Um, I'm not sure, um, you know, I, and I say that with a great deal of grief, right? I spent my entire life um, as someone vested in the evidence equals action equation. Mm. Um, I think that where we will find control and certainty in the future, as I mentioned in my presentation, is in community. And what people who are concerned about evidence-based communities, who are concerned about evidence-based democracy, um, who are concerned about preserving the evidence equals action equation, um, we really need to do a better job of creating community around that idea. We really need to do a better job. We need to be building from the ground up those communities because they're really, those that do exist are really under siege and they're poorly connected right now. Um, so while I may, well, I, I say that community will be sort of the new form of information in the coming decades, I'm not happy about that, but it is an opportunity to try to preserve what we want to preserve out of this society. It's an opportunity to create a more equitable society. It's an opportunity to create a more resilient society. And it's an opportunity to preserve and reinforce evidence-based society. That's what I think we need to be in the business of. We're spending all of this time worrying about 1.5, right? We're spending all of this time worrying about whether or not we can stop climate change when we know that for the next 30 years, it can't be stopped. What we should be spending time worrying about is what kind of society is going to emerge from climate change. That's what we should be spending more time worrying about than we're worrying about right now. And we really need to get ahead of that because the alternative of evidence equals action, the alternative of equity is the creation of authoritarian, nativist and xenophobic regimes as people erect walls to protect themselves from the violence of the environment that is going to be visiting us quite dramatically over the coming years. Where does that creation of community come from? And what kind of scales do people experience that in like in their everyday lives? I think this goes to the point that 
uh, one of the uh, attendees mentioned, right? How do you talk to friends and family members, right? That seem to eat up conspiracies, theories, and like to seek out alternative media, right? You know, how do you deal with this sort of problem? And I think it really is about creating community and creating connections with people, right? It's really about having honest conversations with people and working it out. That's what I think it's about. It's about building that community, about building that connection. We have to start with that first. Otherwise, we'll have nothing. And those are skills, it, it sounds like, a beard. those are skills that you're trying to foster with your students when it comes to fostering empathy and connection. Um, and this is actually one of the questions from the audience members. They, they're they asking about, Janine asks, how do you stir people away from misinformation? Because it's so easy to lose your cool and it can be really frustrating in those conversations. So how, what advice do you give to your students to kind of keep your cool and to remain empathetic in those sometimes difficult conversations? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, and I have many, many, many different answers. And so try and keep me on track, Anari. Um one thing that I talk to my students a lot about is picking your battles. Uh, there are issues that people are going to get emotional about, they're going to get angry about. There are issues that I will get angry about and emotional about that are a bit too close to home. And those are not conversations that are going to be productive for you to engage with. Um, there are also people who are closer to us who we have existing relationships with and therefore we don't have a blank slate that we're going in with. We're going with a lot of baggage into these emotional conversations, into these tricky controversial conversations. So not only just picking your battles, picking your issues that are you're able to distance yourself with, from a little bit more, but also being a little bit more mindful about who you're talking to and are you able to give them the space and yourself the space to engage in this conversation in good faith. Uh, another thing that I talk to my students about and I try and give them ample practice in is listening, um, is sort of conducting an interview with someone without the intention to respond to them, you know, without the intention to fix their misconception. Um, so, for example, in one of my assignments, students have to go to a community member of, from their own communities, so a family member or someone from their own ethnographic or demographic communities, and speak to them about a single scientific misconception that they may have, or it could be uh, broadly um, something like COVID, has, the COVID vaccine hesitation, it could be just general mistrust in science, whatever it is. And the entire intention of the interview is not to address the misconception, but to understand where that misconception came from. But I'm trying to tell my students and show to my students that you can't address misinformation in a single conversation. You have to earn that trust first. And it's over time that by pointing them towards other types of information sources, uh, other more credible uh, authoritative, authoritative sources, do you sort of address that at the baseline? Now, unlike uh, Sean or Rochelle who are doing excellent work, I'll, I am working with science students, uh, undergraduate science students who uh, most of them are not uh, going to go on and do amazing journalism work. In fact, because they're science students, uh, most of them want to go to medical school. So <laughs> a lot of times when I'm talking to them, I'm talking to them about having these difficult conversations in a smaller stage. Um, if you're working with patients and how do you develop that relationship with someone who you're only going to be meeting once, uh, who isn't going to be paying attention to you beyond their immediate diagnosis. And a lot of time, a lot of that work is spending time with them. Um, you're, you had a previous question around what are some like larger things that need to happen in order to change. And this isn't a one facet thing. I can't change misinformation and fix this information in my capacity as a librarian. I think we need to be investing resources in our public education system. We need to be ensuring that people are scientifically literate. They're critical users of information. When I first started doing this work as a librarian, the science literacy staff, um, I brought in examples of retracted papers, for example, in my classes. I brought in examples of scientific fraud, of data falsification. And I met a little bit of resistance from faculty members because they said, hey, uh, we want our students to trust science. We don't want them to think that science is a high school drama where everybody's uh, uh, excited to get some grant money. But I think if we make the process of science that much more opaque, we lose that trust 
And I think our current forms of science communication have been more about feeding science as a, as a noun, as a product, as data, and less about showcasing the human side of science. How do we get that work done? So making that a little bit more apparent and transparent, I think will help as well. That's really great advice. Thank you so much. Um, Cause they can be really, yeah, emotionally charged issues. But as you said, we need so much more public investment and, and resources to solve some of these. Now, I know that we are running out of time, but one of the themes that I've noticed come up in all of your work is storytelling as a tool, whether it be the Climate Disaster Project or Climate Solution Reporting or talking to family members um, to break down misconceptions or misinformation. So storytelling as a tool for building community, sort of to resist misinformation. How do you balance fostering hope while not necessarily engaging in toxic positivity or misleading folks in these tricky conversations. Um, Rochelle, can we start with you, please? There it is. I think uh, a lot of that goes to some of the keywords that Sean and Avir have been mentioning, which is trust, community. Um, essentially, without being Pollyanna, I find um, by focusing, I think you build literacy, literacy around climate change by making it relatable to people. And one way you do that is, and build trust, is I think is reflecting um, community experiences, um, impacts, and also the solutions that they come up with. Um, you know, I really try to focus my stories around a lot of the really um, great climate, environment, uh, uh, um, conservation initiatives that communities are taking um, in order to deal with the climate change impacts on the ground. Um, and I really think you do that by reflecting people's voices and their experiences. Um, you know, some of the former questions and some of the former questions that uh, Sean and Avir were talking about around institutional trusts. And I think one way to, and I agree, you know, places like libraries and um, universities and are great places. They are sources, science, turning, uh, turning science at a local level into how that plays out within a community is something I rely on a great deal. Um, we have a really, um, a node of uh, climate science tied to the ocean here in Quadra Islands, the Hakai Institute. So I rely on um, just as Abir does the, the ex translating the expertise of scientists and the work they're doing and trying to tell it in an engaging way. And I think th those are some of the key ways that the solutions that communities are coming up with, um, particularly for nations in this area of the world, and um, the really interesting science that is being done right here in our communities um, that can inform the solutions we come up with. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, Sean, could you tell us a little bit about storytelling in the Climate Disaster Project? Yeah, so what we're doing with the Climate Disaster Project is students are working with climate disaster survivors as well as one another to share their own experiences with climate change and the climate disasters that they've lived through, because we all are climate disasters in one way, shape or form or another. And I think what's been very encouraging for them, and you mentioned hope, um, I think what's been very encouraging to them is that this class and this project 
It doesn't try to sort of gaslight about where we're at when it comes to climate change. I don't think that really actually helps. I don't think climate change is such a huge, and climate action is such a huge collective action problem that involves our individual and collective decisions, as well as decisions of business and governments, that it can feel out of reach for so many people. Um, and the focus on sort of businesses, what they're doing, governments, what they're not doing, um, sometimes I think really works against hope in this particular situation. Um, so I think what's been relieving for them is let's deal with what's happening to us. Let's not deal with what's in the future tense. Um, let's not just deal with what's happening at an environmental level. Let's deal with what's happening at the human scale. And I think in sharing those stories between one another of how people are experiencing climate change and what they think can be done about it and what they're dealing with in their everyday lives, we can create community around that experience. And if we create community around that experience, then we can feel less alone. We have, feel like we have other people with us. And then we can create hope. That's what we've got to do. Because what we're doing right now isn't working. We've been trying it for over 30 years. It's not working. We need different solutions when it comes to climate change. And I can tell you right now, Abir, after this call, I'm going to connect with you about how we can involve public libraries in that whole entire process and what help I can provide. And maybe we can uh, come up with something cool. Yes, love that. Creating community right here, right now. Uh, it's happening. Yeah, Abir, do you have any last words on storytelling with your work and fostering hope and community? Yeah, the thing about going last is all I want to say is ditto to everything that Rochelle and Sean have just said. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think everything that you guys have said about community building as a form of communication really resonates with me and something that I try to instill in my students in my own classes. Um, on a parting note, I will say that one of the things that I really enjoy about teaching this class, um, and I've mentioned this to Nary in previous conversations, is that this class is situated in the largest program at McMaster University. It's the life sciences program. It also has the lowest barrier to entry, which means that this program has the most diverse students. It has first generation students, immigrant students, um, students from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And for a lot of them, this class is an opportunity to not just listen to other people's stories, it's not just to build community with um, other people out in Hamilton, but it's usually the first time they have been invited to share their own stories. And I, I think that's valuable in any context is empowering our students, our next generations to feel that there is value in their own lived experiences, value in the experiences that they have and how they connect to science communication further down the line. It's been fun. Wow, thank you all so much. Yeah, every I know every episode, I wish I could just, we could keep talking for hours, but I am mindful that Zoom exhaustion is real. Um, so we're wrapping up our episode now with our climate action recommendations and a big thank you to all our guests today. I think sometimes climate action can feel really nebulous and what does that actually look like? So it's exciting talking about it today from a perspective of big ideas and also everyday ideas that we can engage in. Um, so although easier said than done, how do you practice identifying misinformation in your own lives? Whether it be through social media, looking at what kind of platform or news outlets that you get your information from. Do a little digging, become a journalist yourself and think a little bit about who benefits most from you knowing that information. Um, and some information out there, they might be really beautiful infographics or videos that look really nice, but dig into a little bit more about what's in the content itself. And to echo a beer, I wish I could say that a challenge for you is to have one conversation with someone, but let's be real. It's going to be a series of conversations with somebody that you're close with. So maybe as a personal challenge, reflect and think a little bit about who might be, uh, oh, what was the word? A climate science rejectionist yeah. in your own life. <laughs> um, and how can you engage in a series of conversations that 
you are being empathetic and listening and establishing some common values um, from where they have been misled, perhaps through misinformation. Um, and at the end of the day, um, for our third sort of action today, we want to acknowledge it's been an especially diffi difficult couple of weeks for a lot of folks with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so our thoughts go out to people all around the world, including Ukraine, Yemen, Palestine, frontline Indigenous communities, folks who have continued to be oppressed by imperialist oppressors and capitalist greed. And it's really overwhelming sometimes to go to the news and you might feel like, oh, I don't, I just want to zone out today. And that's totally fair. You know, sometimes we have to take care of ourselves. But I do want to encourage folks that we all have a little part to play no matter where we are in the world. So do what you can with what you have, with who is around you as a way of creating community. It's an active, it's an active tense um, initiative. And if you're itching to go out this weekend and get involved in some climate action, 350 Canada on March 12th is hosting a National Day of Action for a Just Transition. And it's sort of doing that community building work and envisioning of what our future could look like transitioning away from fossil fuels. Um, so they have a map and there are communities from coast to coast to coast engaging in this action. So go ahead and see who might be participating in communities around you. And this is our second last episode, so our very final episode for the BMSC Climate Action Series streams in three weeks. So on Wednesday, March 30th, Join us as we explore regenerative ocean farming. A huge thank you to all our guests and all of you for coming today. I know we ran a little late, but we appreciate it. We appreciate you and stay hopeful. See you next time. <laughs>